Welcome everyone to the theory session. I hope it's not going to be too theoretical. Um, my name is Benedict and I'm a quantitative analyst by profession because I'm always stumbling about this word and just saying I'm a quant. Who of you knows what a quant does? Oh, awesome. I didn't expect that. People told me if you go to Berlin with this topic, nobody will understand anything. That apparently is not true. For those who don't know what a quant does, my job is to implement models for the valuation of structured financial products into software. So I'm kind of a software developer. I work with C Sharp in, in our company, but I'm also responsible for these models. So in that sense, I'm closer to a data scientist, but then we don't do something like predictive modeling, but we have very specific types of models, which we call replication models. Um, and so we're kind of a different branch. And uh, today's topic is about the valuation of call rights or exercise rights, making the right exercise decisions. And um, I've tried to pare this down to as little financial background as possible. Uh, you can tell me later if I succeeded with this. Um, my agenda looks like this. I um, intend to give you an example. Um, what call rights, exercise rights are and work this example uh, through the valuation. We're going to do valuation by uh, simulation, Monte Carlo, for those of you who know about it. I'm going to present to you the Longstaff Schwartz algorithm, which is a very nice uh, approximation algorithm for the valuation of call rights and for the determination of exercise decisions. Um, and if I can manage, I'll go a little bit broader in the end. So, what is a call right? A couple of weeks ago, I uh, went through my closet and I found this on the on the left here. That is a gold coin, a uh, half a Kriegerrand. And uh, I don't know what you would do if you found such a coin in your closet and you had forgotten about it for years. Uh, first thing I did, I checked what it's worth. So, uh, 680 euros. And I said, wow, that's more than a PyCon. Uh, cool. Um, then again, I, I remembered the coin and, uh, you know, it's a gift from my grandfather. So I'm a bit sentimental about it. So I'm not just going to cash it in uh, and I want to keep it. Um, then I looked at the gold price of, of the last months and the value of the coin. And uh, you see how it increased fairly well during the last months. So that's good for me. But of course, I don't know about the future. So what is my go coin going to be worth in a year, in two years or whatever? So if you want to answer that question, first thing you do is you create a model. So uh, I, of course I do have simulation model because that is the simplest thing to do. That is, you have the time axis and you have the coin value. You start from 680 euros and then you go into the future and you simulate possible scenarios that this coin value might take in the future. So for example, if you look at the blue line, um, we're starting at 680 euros and say in five years it ends up at 70, uh, 725. So that's a good scenario for me. But of course, there could also be bad scenarios like uh, the orange line where I ended up at 670 euros. So each of these scenarios we call paths uh, gives me one possible view for the future. Now, it can go up, it can go down. What is it that I want? First of all, I want to keep my coin because I'm sentimental about it. Second, if the gold price goes up and the coin value goes up, I want to participate in that. Of course, that's cool, more value. But if the coin value falls, I don't want to lose anything. Um, so you might say, Benedict, you cannot have all that. Um, but I say, yes, I can. Okay, I have to pay for that. And uh, this is the essential question about this talk. How much have, do I have to pay for that? So I'm now going to explain to you how I will manage to get all these things done. And we're going to set up contract, a, a contract between you and me. It works like this. I can pick any day during the next five years. And I'm going to tell you at that day, please pay me the difference between 680 euros and the coin value at that day. So if the value is X, 
then you will have to pay me 680 euros minus X. Specifically, let's say the coin value drops to 610 euros. You're going to have to pay me 680 minus 610 is 70 euros. I can do so once and only once, but I can pick any day during the next five years. So what I now have is a call right or exercise right. I have the right to do so. I don't have to. You have to pay uh, the difference. You, uh, you don't have a right. I have the right. So, and if you want to get fancy, uh, the specific name for this is an American put option. If you want to put something on top of that, it's a cash settled American put option. Remember that for tonight. You can show off. So, uh, for you, this is a really bad contract because anything you can do in the future is lose money. So you will definitely want me to pay a premium to you, to you today. And I'm going to uh, show you how to um, calculate the value of that premium, how to evaluate this option. So let's formalize it a, a little bit more. We now have the coin value on the X axis and we have the option payoff on the Y axis. Uh, if the coin value is above 600 euros, 680 euros, I will not exercise. So there's not going to be any payoff at all. Um, and if the coin value is below, I might exercise. Let's assume I do so. And let's assume the coin value is, is at uh, 610 euros. Then uh, I'm going to receive 680 minus 610 equals 7 euros. So uh, if you want to express that as a formula, that means what I get from the option is the maximum of 680 minus x, which is the current price then, and zero. Okay, let's check if this works out for me. So first of all, whatever the scenario is, I get to keep my coin. Of course, we don't mess with the coin. Second, if the coin value rises, I want to participate. Well, uh, as the option does not pay off anything to me, but also I don't have to pay anything, payoff is just zero, my future value will be X, and that by assumption is larger than the 680 euros, I made money, that's good. If the coin value falls to some value X, I don't want to lose anything. Now the option pays off 680 minus X, which I add to the um, to X, which is the the, the um, coin value at that time. Then I end up at 680 euros again. You made up for the difference. I'm all good because I'm back at 680. So the setup of the American put option works, gives me all my requirements. Now, however, I am tasked with a very difficult decision. And that decision is, should I exercise my option or should I not? Let's look at it from a time point of view. If uh, and at any day where the um, coin value is above 680 euros, I have no decision to make because it doesn't make any sense. But on any day where the coin value is below 680 euros, I have to decide, do I stay in the contract or do I exercise it? Once I have exercised it, it's gone, it's over. So I have to optimize for me uh, how to do that. And you have to determine uh, how much I should pay to you now. So um, what we need for this uh, to, to calculate the value that I have to pay to you, we need the concept of risk neutral valuation. This is a very broad topic. Uh, I'm not going to get into this. We're going to do it very simply. Let's take our model from before each of these paths. Valuation works like this. You take the value that you see on the very right, like those 725, 710, you add them all up, divide them by the number of paths, you calculate the average, and what you get out of that is the price. Of course, it's a simulation-based model, so everything has a margin, um, and uh, it's not going to be perfectly exact, but uh, the more paths you have, the better you get. So that's how valuation works in principle. Um, we need another concept and we need this other concept for um, the decision making that I have to choose. I uh, am tasked with a question when to exercise. So I will um, formulate two types of values. Type number one is the exercise value. That is what I get when I exercise the coin. 
The second thing is, the second value is the continuation value. That's the value I get by not exercising, by keeping staying in the contract. And um, the, the question is now, at what point in time does my continuation value, um, does my exercise value get larger than the continuation value? Because at that day, I will exercise. Um, of course, there may be several days on which this is favorable, but I care about the first one. So um, in this case, the first favorable exercise date is what matters to me. So these two values have to be computed. One of them is easy, one of them is hard. Exercise value is very simple. You just plug in um, the, uh, um, the model, simulated model pass into the payoff function. Payoff function is maximum of 680 minus x and zero. There you plug in the simulated values and you get the picture on the very right. The continuation value, however, is not simple. Um, and there are several approaches to that. I will show you two of which don't work. First of all, I thought, well, that's a simple thing. I got my path. I know the future. I can just compute the continuation value by looking into the future. So let's say we are today at call right. And um, in order to know what my um, call right is worth, what the continuation value is on that very path, I just look into the future and then see uh, what what it's worth. That is approximately akin to buying Google stocks in 2004 when it was worth 50 bucks, when you know that in 2019 it will be worth 1,200. Okay, that's looking into the future. Uh, you can do that, you can model that, but then you will heavily overvalue your call right. So not a good approach, unfortunately. What we would need instead is an expected value on that day. So what we could do is the concept of nested simulation. That means that for each path, we perform another simulation going into the future. The problem is for each path, I'm going to do another, let's say 1000 paths for the future. So I'm already at 1000 squared. If you add another call right at some other point in time, then I will be at 1000 cube and so on. So with the number of call rights, I'm growing exponentially here and that is not good. Um, so for anything practical, like my five year running uh, American option, this is completely impossible for computational reasons. It would be correct, but it doesn't work. So I'll show you the third option. I will approximate my continuation value. I am going to take each and every path and I'm going to um, approximate the value, the call, uh, continuation value at my call write time by a function. I'm going to take the information of all paths and I'm going to average out the individual information of each path. So looking at it from um, this perspective, what you see now here is um, the coin value at time t minus one on the x axis and the continuation value on the y-axis. So this looks like the uh, payoff chart you've seen before, but with a little bit of noise added because it's the point, it's the next point in time. I may now not use each particular point because that would be looking into the future. That would be um, perfect foresight. Instead, I'm going to approximate it using a polynomial function in this case. Uh, don't worry too much about which function to use for now. I'll just use um, a second degree polynomial. What I do now is to average out the information of each individual path to uh, a common expectation. And that means I'm not looking into the future anymore. This is a sound approach. So I'll take a short digression. How do you do um, curve fitting, polynomial fitting in NumPy? Uh, I was actually very surprised to see that I don't need any SciPy for this. Uh, it's just plain NumPy. There is a NumPy polynomial package and uh, it has a nice polynomial class. And all you need to do is um, to say polynomial fit. Give it the degree that you like and it's going to spit out a polynomial. If you're into orthogonal poly polynomials, you can do Legendre, Lagrange and all the stuff that is available 
everything in that package, calculate one polynomial from the other. Very nice. So if you forget anything else I'm telling you today, look into NumPy polynomial. That's cool. Okay, so we got everything ready now um, to talk about the Longstaff Schwartz algorithm. And uh, this is the most code heavy slide I do have. So first of all, we have our simulated values x. These are all the paths uh, simulated into the future. First dimension is the time, second dimension are the number of paths. And um, we do have a strike value. This is in case of the option. It's 680 euros. I just made it simple here, just set it to one. So we're now going to do, um, we're now going to walk backwards in time, starting at the very right or at the very end. First, we're going to take the cash flow that re that is realized if I exercise the option on the very last day, exactly at uh, five years from now. So that's just the payoff of the option. Uh, maximum strike minus X and zero. That is cash flow. So now I'm moving backwards from this very last point in time to uh, closer to today. And I'm first going to compute the exercise value on the day. That is simple, as I said, just plug in into the, um, um, into the payoff function. And then I'm going to look at each and every path that is in the money. In the money means um, I can exercise the option. Um, its value, its payoff would be larger than zero. And I take out all these paths on which I can exercise and then fit a polynomial of my coin value against the cash flow from next time. So this fitted variable that you see here, this is the one thing that carries all the information um, about my um, my approximated continuation value. This is the, the core thing of this algorithm. So uh, fitted now is, is um, a NumPy instance of a polynomial. Uh, that means I can just call it like any function and I'm going to apply it to all the values uh, that I've simulated on that day. Um, there's something interesting about this. Um, if you look at, uh, at the evaluation that takes place here, I only care about the values that I've used for fitting. So uh, in a way, um, I don't use that polynomial to interpolate or extrapolate anything. I'm going to do just in sample um, evaluation of it. That means all I care about in this case is that it has a functional form and I have averaged out information. That's a bit unusual. Usually you want to do interpolation or something if you do curve fitting, but in this case we don't. So, and now I have to make the decision which path has a continuation value that is larger than the exercise value and which doesn't. And based on that, I make my exercise decision do I exercise or do I not? I calculate the resulting cash flow from that and I move on to the next state. So this is uh, how the Longstaff Schwartz algorithm works. It's the simplest way I could possibly formulate it. I've even uh, discarded um, discounting here. So um, it's, uh, I, I don't think you can do it any simpler. Uh, if you know a way, just tell me, I'm interested in that. Uh, if you want to have that in practice, of course it would be more complicated. Let's look at a couple of uh, steps that we create using this algorithm. So what you have here now um, is the approximated continuation value. That's the blue line. So that's a polynomial, in this case degree two. And you see all the resulting cash flows. And you see wherever my exercise value is above the blue line. So um, you see a red X, then I'm going to exercise. If it is below, it's going to be gray. So here, most are um, above the above, uh, blue line, so we're going to exercise a lot. This is at, um, I think this is the last time point before the end. If we move closer to today, it's changing. You already see that there are less points where I will exercise. If we move even closer, you will see none of them left. So this is at uh, one and a half years. So here, no exercise is um, actually feasible. Let's look at this uh, on the time axis. This is what the algorithm generates for us. So each uh, gray point is a simulated value 
uh, where, where it's not favorable to exercise. And each red uh, X is a point where the algorithm suggested to exercise the option. So you can see them all at the bottom and more to the right. Intuitively, that makes sense. The more the option pays off, the more likely it should be for me to, um, to exercise. Now you remember I can exercise only once. So if I have multiple paths, um, I only ever care about um, the first ex suggested exercise on that path. That's what I have in this chart here. So you see less access because um, the ones that happen later are now ignored. You see those paths um, are uh, uh, described as a dashed line because um, I have stopped the option. I've exercised it already. And these are the points where I will make my exercise decision. Okay, so now we got both things. First of all, you know how much you have to charge me. And second, I know when to exercise. Um, you have uh, the good fortune that your estimate for the option value is pretty good. I have the disadvantage that my exercise decision is absolutely awful because if you look at those points, they look totally random. And the problem here is that we're just using an approximation algorithm. There's no exact solution. I've tried to come up with an exact solution for the simple case. In the simple case, it's actually possible by other means. And uh, it should look something like the green line. So the, in a perfect world, if we were not using appro approximation, I would get um, an exercise decision below the green line and above it, I wouldn't. And you see uh, the algorithm is telling me something completely different. So you may wonder, given that I get shitty exercise decisions, how can the valuation be good? And the answer is, if you are in that area where the approximation is very close to the exercise value, so where I'm nearly indifferent between the two, it doesn't make that much of a difference by definition. So um, it is not this terrible if, you, if I make the wrong decision in that sense. So uh, the good thing is here, these errors average out and I still get a pretty good valuation. Okay. So, um, if you want to have something more complex than an American put option, you don't get such a green line from any other model anymore. Then actually approximation is the only thing you can do. And that's why Longster Schwartz is very relevant. If you do more complex call rights, usually um, you might not have an in the money um, uh, path or in the money concept. Um, and you just do the approximation on all paths. If your payoff depends on more than a single variable, for example, in interest rates, then you have to uh, simulate multiple variables. That's still easy. If your payoff is path dependent, meaning, um, for example, you get the payoff that it depends on the average of the past, something like that. Also, we call it non-Markovian payoffs. Then you can still do this. Um, it still works. Um, that's actually the cool thing about this algorithm uh, or Monte Carlo approaches in general. You, st uh, you can still work out more complex payoffs. If you do this in general, um, yeah, you'd have to, have to do a lot of work. You have to do a, a payoff and a call right description language, um, which is uh, actually speaking from uh, experience, a very complicated topic. You have to create risk neutral valuation models. That is all these distributions that I've simulated without telling you. Um, you have to calibrate these models and uh, then the exercise algorithm comes in. Now, um, this is uh, pretty hefty stuff, but uh, that's why banks have their quant departments. Uh, so uh, you'd probably never do this, but what you can do is uh, to first look at this original paper it's very accessible. It has a first chapter that is called numerical example, which explains the whole algorithm by showing you tables of numbers where this is uh, just uh, executed. And what you can do second is to look up these slides and also a Jupyter notebook accompanying it and also creating, uh, well, I've created a, a small Python package that has an implementation of this algorithm, which is a little bit more general. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, I'm now ready for Q&A. Thank you very much. Uh, ooh, questions? Look, 
thank you for the talk. Uh, if I understood it right, it's very essential that your Monte Carlo simulation is somewhat realistic, right? And I guess basically the essence of machine learning and data science is that from the past observation, you can extrapolate in the future. But does that apply to financial markets? Do they behave in the future like they did in the past? Are they actually predictable? So can you comment on, on that? It is a, a very good question. And uh, the answer is a clear no. You cannot extrapolate. And those paths uh, I've shown you, uh, they don't correspond to past uh, realizations of the uh, of, of the uh, gold price but rather they are implied uh, expectations of the market so what you do is a concept of calibration against market instruments that already look into the future that are traded li um, in a liquid market for example european options and from these you kind of get back the expectation that the market has about the future you can get an implied distribution of future um stock price gold price whatever and then you create a model that fits this expectation so kind of a related question to that so it's going to be october 31st soon and then brexit's going to happen and my prediction is that all time series models will probably fail um there's something to be said also here, right? The, the, the uncertainties should skyrocket around that time. H how do you accommodate for these sorts of moments? Because you can probably pinpoint a couple of moments in time when the uncertainty should be super sky high. Yes, actually, there was, um, uh, historically speaking, before uh, the Brexit vote happened, um, there was something very interesting happening with uh, options on uh, the Euro-British pound um, spot. So what you could see uh, that up to that point, the uncertainty was rising. This uncertainty that is implied by the market expectation. Uh, and and before, on the day of the vote, uh, it was on top. And then afterwards, of course, everybody knew. Then the pound dropped. Um, so yes, you can observe this uh, in implied um, volatilities of options. Um, you have to accommodate for that by calibrating to these options. So you can never work with time series models here that extrapolate the past. It doesn't work. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly proxy. Um, it's kind of a proxy. Uh, it is a market expectation. Thanks for the talk very much. Oh, sorry, that's too loud. Um, you told us that you get the, uh, the expectation from what is already traded, but that sounds a bit like the market would expect something and then it realizes because the market expects it. Is it like that? Like this? Uh, in, in a way, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we're using, uh, we're just, um, we're extrapolating in a different space here, if you will. So, um, we have, we have options, not the American options, but the European options, for example, with just a single payoff date. And then, um, we use that information to, um, to calibrate. And then from the models, we come, uh, using the models, we uh, compute the value of more complex products. So this is the, the way it works. Uh, this is not the same thing as statistics statistical fits. That's something completely different. Uh, and w what you do is um, you replicate the prices of liquid instruments in the market using your model. You have to fit these. If you don't fit these, you know, or you already know what that you're wrong. But then using that model, um, you compute the prices of more complex products. And the question is, does that work? Well, it does, but it's actually um, kind of the middle between science and arts. Yeah, so there's a lot going on. Um, the funny thing is, if you trade products then based on that, you will quickly realize whether you're right or wrong. Because if you're wrong with your price, um, then you're going to get priced out of the market. You're going to lose a lot of money. That's why banks have quant departments. Um, we only have time for a very short question. Is it short? <laughs> Good. Uh, is the answer short? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll keep it short. Um, so, from my understanding, following the market, as, as you say, uh, isn't that primarily if you have a market maker strategy, would, would this also apply to proprietary trading desk? Uh, in, in what sense uh, do you mean would it apply? That you sort of estimate the expectation from the market and then act upon those expectations rather than having your own strategies that 
could be arbitrage. Ah, okay, and I see your point now. Uh, this assumes that there is no ar arbitrage. So you're taking the point uh, that you cannot beat the market, you assume the market is always right, and you're less smart than the market. Yeah, yeah, now, now I see your point. It doesn't apply there, yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, please, following questions, you can do it afterwards. Uh, let's thank. Okay.